Well, I think we've got quite a few people with us now. So I think it might be good to make a start. And we're, we are recording, as Sean has just said. So I'll just introduce myself. Um, I'm Andy Pratt, Specialist Health Improvement Practitioner from the Wellbeing team at Live Well and on the Wellbeing at Work team. And thank you very much for joining our webinar today on the subject of alcohol. Um, I hope you're keeping warm in the cold wind. We're very delighted today to be welcoming um, Sean Gray from the Harbour Centre in Plymouth. So we'll come on to Sean soon. We have got plenty of time today for questions and discussion. So please do chip in. Um, I think uh, it's a subject that deserves a, a lot of discussion. We will be looking at the chat um, as we go through Sean's presentation. Um, so you can obviously make comments, put comments and questions in there. We'll be monitoring it, but there'll be plenty of time at the end for an open debate. There's a rough agenda um, on the screen at the moment, but we may not take that long. Um, and I just want to offer a little update from our own work before we move on to Sean. I've just got to get my next slide up here. Which is coming. So just some housekeeping information that we are recording this session. So um, please, uh, if you have any objection, perhaps yeah, obviously perhaps remove your camera, etc. Um, if at all possible, please, when you're not asking a question or speaking, keep your audio on silent. As I said just now, um, put any comments and questions in the chat bar and we'll keep monitoring that. And we will also contact everyone who's registered with us afterwards with a copy of the presentations and any information that is requested. So that's really the basic housekeeping. And just uh, I think most of you have got some awareness of well-being at work, but we're part of a national scheme to promote good health and health promotion via the workplace. Um, Plymouth City Council commissions us and we're working with businesses in Plymouth, by which we mean those businesses which have over half their employees living with the Plymouth postcode that covers a lot of businesses and we've got a really good network and I'm sure many of you have joined us today from different businesses and essentially you can see on the slide there what we offer we offer a range of training I'm just going to let someone in here we offer a lot of training in the well-being at work scheme mostly for free and we'll be making new offers um, quite soon this year. So our choice of training is, is hopefully increasing. And we have a fantastic award scheme, bronze, silver and gold, whereby businesses can demonstrate to, to the world that they've achieved certain standards of looking after and supporting employee health and well-being, which is always in the long run good for the business um, so if you don't know about the scheme please get in touch with us um, it's well worth doing it obviously takes a bit of effort but we're very pleased to have so many businesses undertaking it we have a fantastic network of well-being champions individuals who are based in different businesses who tend to be our contact points and if you like um, uh, cheerleaders or ambassadors for the cause with the support of, of of the businesses and that's quite a large network now we also have well-being champions in the community so we're very very proud of our well-being champions um, and do contact us to find out about that side of our work if you're interested and we also have a very good advert video advert that you can see on our website and online so let's come down to the next very pleased to announce that um, 
we have increased our capacity now in the team to offer you free NHS health checks to take place at your workplace. And as you can hopefully see from the slide, it's for people between the age of 40 and 74, which covers a lot of people. And it's about um, just a nice positive health check. It's to look at measurements such as basic measurements such as blood pressure um, uh, and other things. But really, it's about having a good chat with you about your health and well-being, offering advice when necessary and links. And we do find that it's quite a popular service. So we've we've been behind the scenes trying to uh, increase our capacity. And we've been very lucky to have new colleagues such as Kelly, who's on the call today, who are now able to come to businesses um, and offer this marvellous free service. So it, if you do wish to find out more about that, again, please get in touch with us. We may be able to set up a, a, a one off or even for a, a, perhaps a bigger business, a, a regular clinic. Um, and as I said, they have been very popular. You can scan the QR code as well for more information on that. And I do want to offer special congratulations to two of our members, Wolfer Stanza Solicitors and TH March Insurance, who have just recently achieved the Bronze Award, the first award we offer. And that's quite a lot of work to do that. I do hope they still feel keen and will continue trying to um, go through the award system and may offer an inspiration to, to other businesses out there. So I'm just going to stop my show there. I don't know if I might. I'll just check with Shawnee. Have I missed a slide there, Shawnee? No, you're all good. OK, we're all good there. So. Um, very pleased to introduce Sean Gray from the Harbour Centre in Plymouth who will be talking to us today about alcohol. Sean, would you like to start off by saying what you do um, at the Harbour Centre and a bit about the Harbour Centre's work? Yeah, of course. And, and um, the floor to you. Brilliant. Thanks, Andy. Um, Andy, if you can stop um, sharing, please. And I'll, Oh, beg your pardon. I'll That's share. it. Sorry. I've stopped sharing now, I think. Brilliant. Yep. Thank you. OK, so good morning, everyone. Um, so as um, Andy is saying, my name is Sean Gray. I'm the harm reduction coordinator here at Harbour. Um, who is Harbour or what is Harbour? Harbour is the. Um, the drug and alcohol treatment provider for um, the city of Plymouth. Harbour's been around since 1986 in one guise or another. Um, we started off in 1986 as the Mutley Green Bank um, alcohol project. And then we developed into um, the drug and alcohol um, charity that you that you know today um, in the early 90s. Um, Harbour employs around 90 people. Um, in the city, so it's a big old organisation. Um, we have um, a range of substance misuse practitioners and substance misuse specialists um, who are able to offer um, individualised drug and alcohol treatment plans to people um, who want to access um, our service. Do feel free to ask any questions or put anything into the um, into the chat bar, and um, Andy or Shawnee can uh, can ask your questions for you um, at the at the end if you want to do that. Um, I'm quite happy if anyone wants to wants to chip in. I can't see you um, on the screen. I can only see Andy. But um, if if anyone does want to ask any questions um, as the presentation's going, uh, do feel free. So the aim of today is just to provide you with some general awareness around alcohol. Uh, um, and like Andy says, we, we will touch on um, on 
campaigns like Dry January as well. So what we'll do is we'll have a talk about alcohol, how it works, why it works. Um, we'll, we'll talk about units of alcohol. Units are a funny one. They're really, really useful to know about, but people that Department of Health clinicians always talk about alcohol units, but they never tell us what a unit of alcohol is. Um, so we'll we'll have a look at what a unit of alcohol means. And then we'll like I said, we'll have a look at the pros and cons of um, dry January. And then we'll have a look at what advice you can give people um, as a health wellbeing champion um, in your workplace. So generalized advice and some links to signpost. Like Andy said at the at the start of his presentation, you will get a copy of these uh, these slides at the end of the presentation. So any links that that are on there, you will you will get. OK, so alcohol, what is alcohol? If we think about drug groups, um, the, the model that. That's preferred these days is the drug wheel and on the drug wheel, there are seven different drug groups. When we think of alcohol, we are thinking of a depressant. So a depressant isn't a drug that makes you feel depressed. A depressant means that it slows down or depresses your central nervous system. And the central nervous system is what controls everything that your body does automatically. So anything that your body does without you having to think about it. So that could be your pulse, that could be your respiration rate, that could be the speed that thoughts and ideas go through your head. If we think of a central nervous system depressant and other central nervous system depressants that there are, and we think about the feeling that we get from alcohol, a lot of people after that first drink or the first couple of drinks start to feel really happy start to feel smiley, start to laugh. And you think, how can you get that reaction from something that's a central nervous system depressant? The thing that happens with alcohol or with any kind of central nervous system depressant, like we said, it's, it slows down everything that your body does automatically, like those thoughts and ideas that go through your head. We have what we call inhibitions. And our inhibitions come from our values, our beliefs, our upbringing, um, everything that we do. And a lot of us will have different values in the workplace than we would have outside of the workplace. We would, might treat our friends outside of work differently to our friends or colleagues inside of work. And it's the things that we do. So it's our automatic risk assessment as well. So the things that we know that we shouldn't do, the things that we know that we shouldn't say, those are all our inhibitions, our boundaries. When we take a central nervous system depressant, the speeds that we are able to run those thoughts and ideas through our internal risk assessment get slowed down. So we can often... Um, find ourselves doing things that we wouldn't ordinarily do before we've had that opportunity to run it through that internal risk assessment. So we might do things that we might regret in the morning. We might do things that we don't really want to see on Snapchat or on Facebook. We might do things that might get us in trouble. That's all because we've slowed down that process of the internal risk assessment. Some people say that when they have those first couple of drinks that they feel confident. That it makes them feel really good. It makes them feel free. Absolutely. Again, that's because all the pressures, all the external pressures that our internal risk assessment ha puts on us we are kind of free from that which in some circumstances can be good in some circumstances might not be so good when we think about alcohol and we use the term alcohol 
we mean the pure ingredient. So if we think about um, those pints of ale that you see on the in the picture there, only a, a little part of that will be alcohol. And that's where the other units will come in. The rest of it will be water, will be sugar, will be all of the other stuff that, that makes it up. But when we say alcohol, what we mean is that the pure alcohol ingredient, which is ethanol. But how does it work? Inside our brain, we've got lots of neurotransmitters. And when we take certain chemicals and they go into our body, they go into our blood and they find their way from how they get into our blood. They go to a heart, they go to the lungs, they go back to the heart and then they end up in the brain. They go around all these drugs and they find the neurotransmitter that fires off um, what it what it facilitates and the neurotransmitter that alcohol or ethanol facilitates is GABA. So how that works, it goes to the neurotransmitter, it fires GABA um, through the synapse, so through the gap in between the two neurotransmitters before it gets reuptaken on the other side of that synapse. The more you, the more alcohol, the more ethanol you have, the more of that GABA um, neurotransmitter ends up in the synapse and the more GABA in the synapse is the more the, 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 the more pronounced the effect of the ethanol so the more you drink the drunker you feel that's because you've got more GABA in the synapse alcohol or ethanol does cause some chemical changes in the brain and it's because of those chemical changes that happen all around the neurotransmitter, all around the, the bits and pieces it affects, um, takes a little bit of time to rectify. Now, if you are not dependent on alcohol and you go out like a lot of us might have done at our Christmas parties, we go out, we drink a little bit more than we would usually drink, and then we'd wake up the next day and we would feel ill. We might feel physically ill we might feel a little bit mentally unwell as well so we might we might feel um a bit more anxiety than we would normally feel so it's it it takes a little bit of time for that chemical change to rectify itself in people who are dependent on alcohol it takes a lot lot longer to for, for the body to rectify itself alcohol or ethanol is toxic to the body it's really really toxic to the body so where we have other drugs that we might be that society is generally more concerned about if we say heroin um Heroin is a strong, strong drug, but our body can process morphine. It can process it through the liver with absolutely no problem at all, which is why hospitals use morphine, because it, it, it does the job well and it doesn't do an awful lot of harm unless you use too much of it. Alcohol or ethanol is different. As soon as it's in our body, our body treats it like a poison which is why it needs to expel it as quickly as it can. Which is why if you have people that drink um, a lot in a short space of time, they might vomit. It's your body's way of getting that, that toxic substance out of it to, to protect it. It's your body's way of protecting, protecting you, protecting itself. But like I said at the start, alcohol units 
Alcohol units on a new thing. They're not new. Um, but about 20 years ago, the um, European Union asked all, all member countries to put um, the unit amount on every container of alcohol. So that increased public awareness of what an alcohol unit is. So we learned that every can of I don't know, four percent lager has about two units in it, has about one point eight units in it. But still nobody told us what a unit of alcohol is. So one unit of alcohol is ten mil of ethanol. Okay, so one unit means ten mil of ethanol. So that would mean that if you had your 440 milliliter can of lager, that's 1.8 units, you would know that 18 mil of that 440 mil is pure alcohol. The rest of it is all the water, all the fizz, all the chemicals, all the stuff that they put in it to extend its life to stop it from going off in the can. But 18 mil of that would be pure alcohol. You can see on the equation there, so that's an equation to work out how many units are in, are in each, each drink. So you can use this for any container of alcohol. So it's the ABV, the strength, times the volume, how much you've got, and then divide it by a thousand. When we think of a thousand mil, we think of one litre. So that makes it really, really easy to work out the units of one litre. So if we think about a one litre bottle of gin, that's 37 percent alcohol we know without needing to do that equation that that's 37 units because it's already worked out it's already a thousand mils if we think of one liter of frosty jack cider we know that that is nine percent so we know that in one liter there is nine units we know that so that makes it a bit easier for working out how many units you drink or someone that you're you're supporting drinks and that brings us on to the department of health recommendations now it used to be up until up until 6 years ago i think it was that men were allowed to drink up to 21 units a week and women were allowed to drink up to 14 units a week um, the rationale for that was body mass. Um, so it is males tend to be more or have more body mass than females, so therefore they're able to drink more. They realized that there wasn't an awful lot of sense in that. Um, and it doesn't really send a message of equality, but it also doesn't send a message of safe drinking and safe use of alcohol. So when we think of equality, there was two options. It's either bring men down to 14 units in line with women or bring women up to 21 units a week in line with men. And there seemed to be only one, one option there, didn't it? One sensible option and that was to um, bring men's recommended weekly allowance down in line with women so that means every person every adult is recommended to drink no more than 14 units of alcohol a week with two alcohol free days out of seven okay so that's not drinking every day so two units every day wouldn't that wouldn't be okay or that the department of health says that that wouldn't be okay so that's not an awful lot is it that's not an awful lot of units at all 
I don't know of anyone who uses alcohol recreationally that drinks within those limits. So anyone that's a user of alcohol, um, you know, I, I, I don't know in my personal life, anyone that drinks within those units. And I think that shows us the scale of the problem. It does show us the scale of the problem. When we know that alcohol is a toxic drug, a toxic substance, when we know the damage it can cause over a long term to someone's body, to someone's physical health, to someone's mental well-being, And that we, or I can say that I don't know of anyone that uses alcohol recreationally that drinks within safe limits. It's a pretty big problem that that we've got. Um, we know some of the symptoms of alcohol um, or the effects of alcohol that we have. There's weight gain, obesity, where alcohol plays a part. There's mental well-being. So we know that when we drink regularly, we our sleep is affected. We don't feel as happy and as alert because we've got that hangover feeling. We've got that anxiety. Some people call it anxiety because it's it's it does come part and parcel with it. So if we're in that kind of state of mind a lot of the time, it's going to have that long term effect. On our on our mental well-being if we're not feeling great and if we're feeling a bit sluggish a little bit rubbish we're probably not going to be doing the things that we enjoy quite so much we might not be getting to the gym we might not be doing the swimming we might not be spending time with family with friends as much as we'd like to and that leads to other effects as well um loneliness breakdown of relationships, loss of connection. So that one drug facilitates a lot of problems, doesn't it? Um, whether it's societal, whether it's about our health, whether it's about our mental health, whether it's relationships, work, it causes quite a problem. And that's where we start coming into campaigns that Drink Aware might raise. Um, I think the one in October, um, it's not Stoptober, is it? That's the smoking one. Is it Sober October? Um, that's the that's the Macmillan one. Um, that's where these come in. And the aim of taking a break from alcohol is the first one in the pros column. It's to get people to regain control, regain mastery over their own alcohol use. So that we don't have alcohol as that regular routine. So we get into that habit of going home, make tea, have a bottle of wine. Lots of people fall into that habit. So it helps people to regain that control. We've talked already about the physical effects of alcohol. So having a break away from alcohol, it can improve your mood. It can improve your sleep. It can help you lose weight. So there's a lot of really good things that come from taking a break from, from alcohol. And then there's the bit that we were talking about earlier around the inhibitions. It gives us that opportunity to reflect on behaviours that we like when we drink and perhaps some behaviours that we don't like so much when we drink and we can think about what we want to do with those. Whether there's any, any connections that we can regain, whether there's any relationships that we can improve. 
in that time off. So it, it gives us that space where we can think about our well-being. But like I say, there's a lot of really good things that come from it. Let's think about the other column then. So there isn't any evidence of there being any long term health benefits through temporary abstinence or through taking a break. Now, that could be due to many reasons. That isn't me saying that it doesn't have any long term health benefits. It's really, really difficult when you have millions of people facilitating this um, month long break from alcohol um it's really really difficult to get around and get tabs on everyone and see see who's doing what seen what's been successful what barriers people have had so that we can evaluate it it's so broad and it's so massive and it's so popular it's really 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 difficult to monitor the success what we do know through people that have done this and through what people have told Macmillan and Drink Aware is that once they've completed dry January, it's, yeah, I did that. Brilliant. Let's go to the pub and celebrate. Um, it's natural. We know that when we've achieved something, we like to feel good. So that means when it when it, we feel good, we're getting that dopamine and serotonin rush as well. So that means that first drink or that first night in the pub after dry January, you're getting the effects of alcohol, which is the GABA, but you're also getting that reward. You're also getting that big burst of dopamine and serotonin that makes us feel brilliant and really good that we've achieved something. And then we've got, you know, when I said people fall into that habit of going home, cooking tea, putting on curry, have a bottle of wine. Easy to do. And wine tastes nice. So it's, you know, it's, it's easy to do. It's these campaigns like Dry January where people notice withdrawal symptoms where people notice some shaking in the morning, some increase in anxiety, when people start to feel really sick and when people start to have craving for more alcohol and feel like they need to have a drink to, to get through the day. There isn't any little bell that goes off when someone becomes dependent on alcohol there isn't any alert there isn't anything that kind of sneaks up on you and you won't know that you're dependent until you don't have it so the thing with dry january is lots of people go through that with no support some people don't know about symptoms of withdrawal so oh this must be what everyone feels and they don't drink. We also need to have a think about um, shame and stigma around alcohol and dependency. If you suddenly become aware that you're dependent on alcohol, who are you going to tell about that? Do you tell the people at work? Do you tell your family? Does that mean that you've got to go to AA meetings and say, hello, my name's Sean, I'm an alcoholic? Is that what that means? You know, it's it's so it's all of those feelings that come with it. And like I say, people don't realise that they are dependent until they don't have it. So it's these events where we see, we at Harbour see our referrals go up, um, not in January, usually at the February time. Um, of people that have tried doing dry January, that have tried making resolutions and they haven't quite worked. So what can you do? What can you do? 
diaries are really, really useful when it comes to monitoring how much somebody drinks. So if somebody comes to the health and wellbeing champion or some or something that you can suggest in one of your wellbeing meetings is that if you do get a little bit worried about your drinking, just keep a diary of how, how much you drink. And if possible, how many units you drink. You've got that equation now to work out alcohol units. So units of alcohol is much more useful than volume of alcohol when it comes to wanting to make a reduction plan. You can tell people that there's loads of apps on their phone. You can go onto the Play Store um, or the App Store. Um, I think on the next slide, I've got I've got a link to um, Drink Aware. There's a really good one on Drink Aware where you can just monitor on your on your phone and it tells you um, how many calories is in that. It, it you know it breaks it all down and gives you that that comparison. So it's like you know you've drunk a bottle of wine. That's the equivalent of three Big Macs, things like that. So it's it's things that sort of make us stop and think. Another bit of advice that's really good is try not to drink alcohol on your own. Using alcohol or using any kind of drug as a celebration, as a connection, is okay because it because it's it's that kind of connection that's there. I say it's okay, obviously, you know, it's, it's with, within the law if we talk about other drugs. Um, but you know, alcohol as part of a celebration, it is recognised in our culture that that happens and that's okay. When we drink on our own, it's it's really easy to fall into that habit of self-soothing. When we've had a really bad day, I'll just go to the pub on my own. If we've broken up or a relationship has ended, I'll go for a drink on my own. I'll, I'll feel better after that. And that's where things become, rather than a celebration, it becomes a coping strategy. And that's a, a, a really easy way that we can start slipping into into dependency dry january sober october don't even try it if you feel any physical symptoms of withdrawal there it's not safe it's not safe um we know that if if somebody experiences severe withdrawal, um, it can do damage to us. It's really difficult. It's it's a difficult old process for our bodies to go through. Um, even the medicated withdrawals, the um, the tablets, the detoxes that um, that our teams at Harbour put people through, they will only put them through that process twice a year because it's it's such a, a a rigorous process just for our bodies to go through clearing all the alcohol out so it's about having those conversations with teams don't you know don't go through it just because everyone else is and if you do feel those symptoms of withdrawal it's about you know if we talk about these things open and honest we can start tackling some of the stigma associated with it and we can start talking about some of the shame associated with it and as well-being at work champions we can start thinking about how we how we can support our colleagues our friends to access the right kind of help rather than them having to go through a really painful process on their own and not talk to anyone about it setting limits is a really good way you know, I know I know a couple of people personally that aren't doing dry January. They're doing damp January. It's something that they've made up on their own, where it's, we're not going to go completely alcohol free. We're just going to cut our alcohol consumption in half, which is OK. You know, it's still they're still going out. They're still having a drink. They're still having fun. But they're just sort of like just keeping tabs on it. They're setting a limit on it. Again, it's a way of keeping that or getting back in control a bit. So whether that is a financial limit, whether that is a volume limit, 
whether that's a number of drinks limit, that's completely up to you. And it's completely up to the people that you're advising as well. So it's all got to be what the person wants to wants to achieve. The goal has got to be completely unique to them. So if they can think of a limit, how they're going to limit it, let them. Let them. Finding alcohol-free ways to have fun. There might be some people that you work with where every Friday they end up going to the pub. If they come to you and they're wanting advice around their around their well-being, we could have a think about other ways, other alcohol-free ways to have fun. The cinema. It's a lot cheaper. Um, maybe. I don't know if Cineworld World is, but uh, you know, it's is things like that where you know it's where we can go, we can have fun, we can still get that dopamine, that serotonin rush that we want without having the effects of GABA, without having the effects of alcohol. I think the the best bit of advice that there is, is either you asking for help. So our contact details will be on on, um, the last slide and encouraging the people that you work with to ask for help. Nobody has to be going through this on their own. And like I keep on saying, it's the, a lot of the shame, a lot of the guilt, a lot of the stigma is what keeps people doing these things on their own or keeps people from making those changes. So if there's bits that we can do or there's bits that you can do, so talking about alcohol, talking about dependency, talking about withdrawals, talking about what support is there, it makes people think, right, okay, if they're talking about it a lot, maybe I can talk about it. And that's how we tackle stigma. And that's how we become trauma informed in taking that stigma and making subjects okay. So a few tools that you can use. So like I say, you'll have all these after. Um, You've got the audit tool. So audit, the alcohol use disorder identification test um, was developed by um, the World Health Organization. And it's a 10 question test and it gives you a score at the end. Um, It's not going to tell you whether the person is dependent on alcohol, is not dependent on alcohol. All it's going to give you is a score on the scale of how hazardous the the person's drinking is. And it will give you a few hints, tips on what kind of whatever category they call they fall in. So whether it's one to five, whether it's six to ten you know it it will give you some some hints and tips what you can suggest what you can advise that person so i say it's not a test it's not a test of dependence it's not a test of alcoholism it's nothing like that it's just going to talk about your uh, how, how hazardous your alcohol consumption may be the second one down the drink tracker and tools there's so many different tools that you can get on your phone through drink aware um, so drink aware is a it is a government site um, but there's a whole load of things that are that are, you know you've got drink free days where you can um, put in your alcohol free days and it'll come up on your phone and give you a push notification so today's one of your alcohol free days right in the morning so that we've got that in our heads right I'm not going to have any alcohol and that can be our two alcohol free days they've also got the unit tracker um, so you can go in there, record how many drinks you've had, and that's your drink diary. Um, it will calculate all of the units for you if you don't want to sit at home and do your equations. Um, and then you've got um, our website as well. Our website is being redeveloped at the minute, so you might get some old information on there. But the information that's about alcohol and about units and how to reduce is um, that's not going to change. All right, so all the stuff on our website about alcohol is still 
current. So do feel free to go on there and have a look. So thank you. Um, there's our details on there. So our website, our telephone number, our um, handles. We haven't got, I don't think we've got anyone on our Twitter handle at the minute. So uh, so don't use Twitter. Uh, but yeah, Facebook, Harvard Charity, um, you can get on there. Um, keep in touch, ask questions, ask away. If you've got people that are coming to you and work, if there's things that, that you might find handy you just want to ask if you're putting on a, a health and well-being campaign at work and you want to know what would be good what wouldn't just get in touch and ask all right we welcome that so thank you um i will stop sharing now thank you very much sean thank you very much indeed i found that very interesting cool. um i I think there'll be probably some questions from people on the call. We've mm -hmm. got a couple of uh, two or three comments in in the, in the chat, which one is a question. Actually, make mm -hmm. a couple of questions. I might just start off myself though with yeah. a couple of quick questions to you. Firstly, quite personal, really. I have a, a, a close friend, and I believe that now and again they might have the the shakes with their hands. Um. Mm -hmm perhaps in the day or in the morning, um, which one suspects is, is an alcohol, an early alcohol withdrawal sign. I'm not quite sure, so I quite like your view on that. Um, then the more general question, um, which is of, uh, hopefully of general interest to us, just from all your experience, when when you're promoting harbour, say at a university stall and other places you go to, which is very much applies to us and our team and many of our champions, perhaps, is top tips maybe for, for raising the issue in the first place. You know, perhaps someone might not be coming to you, but you might just want to ask them how they feel about the drinking. I just don't know if you've got any sort of top tips around that, because mm -hmm. as you say, it's a very delicate area. So thank yeah. you. Yeah. Cool. No worries at all. Um, right. It's the first question that you asked. Um, it could be. There's a lot of things that can cause our hands to shake. Yes. So it might be it, it might be um, low blood sugar. It might be onset diabetes. It might be anxiety. Um, it might be alcohol withdrawal. Um, we know that the DTs are um, part of, of withdrawal from alcohol. I'd be asking the person. Um, I'd, I'd be upfront with that person, yeah. especially if you've got that connection with yes. them and it's someone that you know. Um, I, I would be asking sort of like, oh, I've, I've noticed that your hands are shaking. What's going on there? Um, but yeah, it could be consistent with with alcohol withdrawals. We we can't force our our friends, our no. colleagues, <laughs> to talk to us about alcohol. Sometimes it'd be really nice if we could, but um, you know, we we can't we can't do that. Um, so it's about making making our friends, making our colleagues aware that they can come and talk to us. And that leads us on to the next question that you've got. How can we facilitate that conversation in the first place? I always find that having a general chat, so not going up to someone that might look a little bit drunk, that might look a little bit um, exhausted, that might not be fair if we if we start targeting people and going, you look like you might have an alcohol problem. <laughs> um, but, you know, if I think it's if we can start talking in meetings, in well-being meetings about our alcohol consumption and start having a generalised um, conversation around our alcohol. Things that we could do if I don't know how. I don't know what it would be like in in certain workplaces. Um, it might just be a small team thing. Having a team drink diary, if you feel confident in sharing that, you know, it's it's not somebody um, making that one to one disclosure or targeted. It's something that's across the board and something that's right. Okay, how about we all monitor our alcohol use over a week, over a month? I know there's lots of organisations that do that with weight loss um you know is, is having a team having a group um diet see who who can lose the weight who can lose the most weight and make it a bit of a, a, a bit of healthy competition 
so it's it's that sort of thing where where I, I would be encouraging people to do group activities um and to encourage that that group contribution rather than rather than taking um rather than than going up to people and saying are, are you okay um obviously we can do that if there are real real concerns but that might not be the health and well-being champion that might be something that you would take to a manager to to um to have that conversation so yeah so i would be thinking anything that's healthy anything that's communal anything that's going to spark a little bit of um bit of morale a little bit of um motivation um anything that we can do as a group is is things that i would recommend thank you sean i just want to i've got a, a question here from jay daniels uh -huh. jay says i've seen a few videos on social media saying rather than doing dry january if people aim to complete one week out of each month of the mm -hmm. year with no alcohol this equates Where have you gone, Andy? <laughs> Shall I finish feeding it for Andy? Oh. Whilst goes to three months, no alcohol consumption. Oh, you're back, Andy. I just was finishing off for you. So, by the end thank of you, the Jenny. Year. <laughs> it's all right. Thank you. I suddenly um, saw my connection had gone. Oh, uh, what are people's thoughts on this? Is it still similar to dry January, but just feels more flexible? I think that could be a good one for debate. Um, I think if if we think about our why we're doing dry January, um, it, most people do it to hit that reset or to reduce their alcohol consumption to be more mindful of their alcohol consumption. Um, I think by reducing one week out of the month. It's probably going to be more like the the damp January that a couple of my friends are doing rather than the dry January. But that's still helping us to be mindful. It's still helping us to to reduce. It's still keeping us in control and recognizing how much we're drinking. Um, I think it's completely individual. I think people get an awful lot from knowing that there are a lot of people taking part in dry January and you know you, you can often find people you can often find online communities you can often find friends at work um outside of work um that are also taking part so there's that that aspect of camaraderie and support we might not have that if we go for one week over the year but if we are do in dry January as as that process to be more mindful of our alcohol use. Um, do we need it? Is that necessary? What are other people's thoughts? Oh, I've got David Teb. Have yeah. you got thoughts yeah. there, David? I have. I think that's an interesting thing, really. That one week out of or um, the first thing that comes to mind is, uh, and I suppose it's a similar mindset to uh, congratulating yourself for getting something done by going down to the pub. Uh, you know, I think there's a risk that sometimes you, you feel like, well, I can drink heavier in those other three weeks now and, mm -hmm. uh, and therefore negate any, uh, uh, any positive sort of, um, um, you know, any positive effects of doing that. So I think um, uh, it's about, I think, for me, one thing I've, I've not heard, and I did come to the meeting late, I apologise for that, but it's about being honest with yourself um, first and foremost. So those, that's really where my, my mind goes on that. I think it, mm -hmm. it, it can act as a really good Kickstarter, but you have to be honest with yourself. Absolutely, I agree, David. And that's where that's where the diaries come in. Um, so lots of people minimise their alcohol use. They, oh, I don't drink that much. But then once we start keeping that diary, once we start recognizing how much we are drinking, that's where a lot of people go, oh shit, yeah, um, that's I, I am drinking a lot and maybe I need to do something about that. So that's where, that's why we say always start off by um, keeping a diary. A lot of the time, people might think that they um, they might have a little bit of a problem, but then 
oh, you know, I haven't got that much of a problem. You know, I know someone in work that drinks more than me. So again, we can minimise it. So asking people to be honest with themselves from right from the offset usually comes with some of some additional challenges. But keeping that diary and getting that evidence in black and white up front, we can there's no hiding from it then it's it's written down we've written it in our own hand and uh that's how much there is and, and you know is it's seeing the scale of the problem there but thanks david i've got um i know kelly's had her hand raised for a little while and then there was okay. just someone else sorry the name is just gone shall we take your question first kelly are you on your just do your mute you're on mute i <laughs> So, so yes, I'm the, the 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 new person who's who's doing the the health checks in businesses at the moment. Um, cool. And you know we have we have support for people who want to stop smoking or want to lose weight, but all we really do with the the alcohol is say, oh, look at drink away. And I just wondered if there's something that we could do within the the you know just the space of a few minutes. To, to support them a little bit more than that that because I mean I had a late uh, uh, somebody recently who um scored sort of in the in the possibly dependent category on the audit C but she doesn't feel like she's got um any issues she she, mm -hmm. she just likes the taste of wine and so she drinks wine every day mm -hmm. um but I kind of feel like you know leaving it to to mm -hmm. them to to then go and seek that that help yeah. is not you know yeah. yeah um kelly you're we're, we're gonna really struggle with changing someone's behavior when they no. don't recognize it being a problem and they don't want to change it um so that's where i was saying it at the start you know it's sometimes i wish you know we could uh, we could make people see see that there's some challenges see that there's some problems there but we can't we can't we have to work with what the person gives us mm. um so i think you know it's it's pointing it out to the person um this is where you are on the audit on the audit c this is what possible dependency means these are our recommendations have a look at these apps come back and see us if if you do want to make some changes mm. if the person says nope i don't want to make any changes we can keep on having that conversation with them we can keep on checking in with them um we can't we can't make someone change if they don't want no, to absolutely. even but, but if, even if they we know it's in their best interests yeah to... but it's it's just more kind of like i say if if, if you want to quit smoking we've got that support available mm -hmm. if if they want to talk to someone what what what, what are the options because I, I don't think yeah. we're commissioned to do that so uh-huh so that would probably be a referral into Harbour. Okay. Um, so things that we offer at Harbour, it's not all um, you have to come in, you have to meet with a key worker, you have to go to AA meetings, anything like that. We okay. are we are able to offer alcohol brief interventions, which is a three week intervention. And it's, oh, okay. all, it's all around behaviour change. So rather than being about the person's drinking and the person's what, you know it, 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 it calling people alcoholics all of that kind of stuff it's no. it's not it we don't talk about the alcohol um it's all about the behavior and the associated behaviors with it and the reasons why people might drink and other things that we might be able to do to to change okay. as, aspects of our life so I, I would be thinking about you know if somebody does want to make some changes um a referral into harbour for their for a brief intervention might be something that we can do and um, can they self-refer as well they can self-refer as well yeah okay if you've got so, any information or any leaflets that i can give out that'd be great about that uh-huh because that's a much yep. much sort of softer approach so yeah yeah okay um so i will see what i can get together and i'll put something in um internal mail um if you can if you can send me um an email kelly um andy will have my email address um send it across to me um and i'll um i'll pop some bits in uh, internal yeah. mail for you and you'd be pleased well, to hi. know that harbour is on our new uh, leaflet that we give to people so <laughs> brilliant <laughs> you're getting lots more uh, referrals that's <laughs> great cool I think Thanks, I had Kelly. a raised hand from Thomas Pink. 
Is Thomas still with us? Yeah, my question was just answered. So, oh, thanks, Thomas. Yeah. Um, now, some, just uh, anyone else raising their hands? And I'm just checking the chat here because we've just got a comment here from. Um, seemed very good to me from. Oh, hang on. I was going backwards here. Ian Smart, a thought and stigma when referring people to, for example, mental health services, there's often refusal for them to engage the person is in drink. So this increases the stigma and reduces the likelihood that people with a drink problem will engage with services that can help them. There seems to be poor recognition that some people need alcohol to function or have the Dutch, ooh, hang on, Dutch courage, sorry, Dutch courage, inverted commas, to to engage. So that's a very interesting thought, isn't it? Uh, have you come across that, Sean, that mental health services will? Um, yes, yeah, yeah. Um, lots of services. Yeah. Um, so what the what we have in Plymouth is a local dual diagnosis strategy. Um, but what we also have in Plymouth and in Livewell services and in um, UHP services is overstretched workforce, is yeah. lack of capacity in services. Um, so we've got we've got the strategies that say this is how we should all work together around substances and we shouldn't say it's a substance use problem or it's a mental health problem, but we need to find that that common way of working together. Um, in reality, it's really, really, really difficult for services to to do. Um, so yeah, we we do see that. We do see um, you know if if we have a look at UHP, we have a look at psychiatric liaison. Um, you know, the person's in drink, yeah, um, come back, we'll see you when you're sober, they discharge themselves. so it's it's it can be really, really difficult. Um, so yeah, recognize that. Um, appreciate your comment, Ian. There's a very good comment here, I think, very important one for to get your view on, Sean, from from a, a I think a Livewell colleague actually, Sarah Bissett. I struggle in our team as one of the minority of people on our team who don't drink. I feel under pressure at work events to drink or explain sorry, or explain why I don't drink. Any advice, please? And I think that's probably quite a common thing that people can feel in many situations. And I just whilst whilst we've got it here, there's a colleague of mine, Lynn Jones. Is there a waiting list for harbour services? How quickly do you see someone who comes to you for support? Because when you mentioned your three week brief intervention, my ears pricked up and I thought, well, it could be a lot of people might like that. Mm -hmm. But if, if you've got any comments from Sarah about. Um, if you're not a yeah. drinker. Yeah, um, that's quite an old, outdated attitude, isn't it? Um, yes. Where people people go out, they choose not to have a drink. Why aren't you drinking? What's wrong with you? You're pregnant? You're on meds? What's wrong with you? Um, I think through podcasts that I listen to, through pieces of research that I read, um, that that attitude is slowly changing. Emphasis on slowly. Um, Sarah, absolutely nobody should be judging you and nobody has that right to judge you or to pressurize you into drinking. Nobody has the right to do that. And you don't have to give an explanation or a rationale. You don't owe that to anyone. Um, you just go and you be you and you do what you're going to do. Um, and it's it it might be about, you know, people recognizing that in you. It might be having a word with um, a trusted colleague, someone that you get along with to say, you know, it's uh, with. I'm not going to be drinking. Can I come to you if anyone starts pressurizing me? Can you tell them to back off um, if if you don't feel that you can do that or that you want to do that? Um, you can ask someone else to um, to 
to come and fight your corner, to come and support you, to come and uh, be with you, stand stand alongside you. Um, you know, but like I say, absolutely nobody has the right to be pressurising you to be making comments about any kind of behaviour. Nobody has the right to do that. I'll just chip in there, Sean, that I think culturally, um, in many cases, alcohol scenes are so normal in, in this our mm -hmm. culture. You almost think everyone's at it. And the actual statistics show that I think 20 percent of people won't have a drink in a year. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of people who don't. I've yeah. got a hand up here from David Tebb. Mm -hmm. Hi. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree. And I do think that's one of the one of the difficulties with trying to have a bit of a dry spell for yourself mm -hmm. when you're challenged. I've been I've done it a few times myself and it, it gets annoying after a while, you know, when, when uh, yeah. while you're not drinking, you know, what's the matter yeah. with you and all of that. Um, but one thing I found for myself that, that really did, did help was just being really clear that in myself, the reason why, once you clarify the why to yourself, that personal reason that you've got, um, you know, and for example, if it's uh, you mentioned pregnancy, well, well, there's a really strong why that you can't that you can't uh, um, that that's, you find difficult to push back against. And I felt that when people understood my why, there was more respect, and therefore I was uh, left alone a bit easier. And and I think sometimes maybe if you approach the, the the free drinking stint, if you like, with not really understanding yourself why you're doing it, just having this vague idea that it's going to be good for you, it can be difficult to have the conversation. So again being just clarifying your own why mm -hmm. I think helps or help me anyway. No, it's great to get your own, to get your own reflections on that, David. So thank you. Um, I do think, you know, it's, it's being honest and having that, having that, um, that conversation can be really helpful. Um, on the flip side though, people shouldn't be, or you, you shouldn't have to be explaining that why it should just be accepted that you know you're david's not drinking okay um there there shouldn't be any kind of pressure on you david to explain that why yourself absolutely you got to know yourself why you're why you're doing things but it's uh it's you don't owe that explanation to anyone david sean can i just ask you about the waiting list situation yeah sure horrible? um no there's no waiting list um, so it's, it's, um, referrals. Um, we do have a target set by us, um, that somebody gets, um, or from referral to, um, comprehensive assessment within 21 days. Um, we are well within that. We are well within that. So, um, right. no, there's no, no waiting list. Um, another question from Kelly. Sorry, something just occurred to me, kind of going back to what I said before. When they do that three-week intervention, are they they're not expected to to stop drinking completely no. if they want to still be social drinkers? No. Okay. Just no, no, no expectation on them. It's like I say, it's all around behaviour change rather than drink change. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's quite a good theme for our work. Hopefully. Um, uh, I, has anyone else got any other questions now um, or anything else to say about today's event? Oh, I've just got, oh, so David's just going to tell. Oh, Warwick. Yeah, I just wanted to check, you know, the audit you mentioned in your slides, is mm -hmm. that is that the same as Audit C or is that a different audit? Um, so Audit C is the compact version of Audit. Um, so i if if you want to be a traditionalist, um, it, it, you would just go for the audit tool. Um, a lot of people in primary care um, would use the the compact version, which is just five questions, I think. Um, but it it will still give you the same the same score. It's all part of the same tool. Thank you. Okay. What else is in the um, in the chat, Andy? The is there anything else? Got one little comment here, an early one for me and Smart mm -hmm. again, pointing out quite rightly in a way that m most people who are likely to be susceptible or receptive to the dry January message are unlikely to think they have an alcohol issue mm -hmm. and so don't think it's relevant to them in the first place. And I can see what Ian means there. That can be a generic problem in health improvement. Um, and I'm just going to come down to some new messages that have just come in. Um, Yes, it's. Oh, yes, we've got. Oh. 
<laughs> a pretty good comment from from a colleague Lynn here, who says, who who, who if she, it, it, it says I tend to let the group I'm going out with know in advance that I will not be drinking. I also let them know that that does not mean I'm always the taxi, <laughs> which, which I think is a really good yes, point. <laughs> Although you can, of course, if you are the taxi, really build up your credit for favours. So sometimes there's a good thing about not drinking. David's just thanks you very much for the presentation. And I think there's another comment here, Sean. Um, well, Kelly's pointed out quite interestingly, I mean, you might have noticed this, Sean, because you've been at the university for events, that uni students we've spoken to, and I think I know I was with Kelly at the uni fair, are not so interested in getting drunk anymore. So it seems the tide may be turning. I do remember myself where I met you, Sean, at that fair, some students saying to me, oh, yes, they're really promoting it, but I'm not interested, you know, because it is a part of the Freshers' Week traditionally to get rather drunk. Yeah. Um, yes. I think I think that's interesting. Um, I think there are... I think a lot of younger people are waking up to the harms of alcohol and that it is really harmful and it's not sensible to have something this harmful being being part of our culture. Um, on the flip side of that, we do know that ever since people started peopling however many millions of years or thousands of years that was, we've always bitten a root, smoked a leaf, see what happens to um to change our our mindset so i think what we need to be mindful of is yes people might not be getting as drunk we it might be too early to say whether people might be doing other things they might not be they might not be um but I don't know. I think it might be worth um, having that conversation with people. Um, and it might just be worth having it on our radars that if somebody isn't drinking, absolutely great. Any other drug use? And that could be a question that you ask. You know, I know it's asked in primary care a lot more now at your GP. What's your alcohol use? How many units do you drink? Any other drug use? So I think it, it might be worth having those having those conversations. Let us say, absolutely, it might not be. Um, and we don't want to be doing that in any kind of judgmental way. Um, but it's, it's just something to be mindful of. Quick question from Jenny here. Uh -huh. Jenny? Hi. Sorry, I was Hello. just slowing my hand, but I switched my camera off by mistake. <laughs> there we go. Um, I've actually got an 18-year-old son who doesn't drink and doesn't want to drink but feels the pressure around it um and quite interesting when he had his birthday cards um I think one of them had a pint of beer on the front so it just sort of uh symbolizes you know when mm -hmm. you turn 18 is it is a, a sort of passage of life that you need mm -hmm. to take um and we've spoken about how he can sort of continue to stick to his principles and values of, of mm -hmm. what he wants to do, but sort of coping with different situations um, that crop up. But he does sometimes feel a bit of pressure around it. Um, but I just wanted to say that in the chat, I've posted a business toolkit um, which also talks about the um, issues within the workplace about people driving and operating machinery and how important it is um, that alcohol and drugs are cons considered because it affects people's ability to um, work in the workplace. So that toolkit has um, lots of information within that. Um, so recommend businesses have a look at that. I've also posted um, just some evidence that has come out from Scotland on the minimum pricing um, unit of alcohol. So in 2018, the Scottish government um, introduced minimum pricing on alcohol and they now have the results from that and it has been a success. And, and I've just put a bit in the chat about how it's reduced um, alcohol related deaths and hospitalizations and it's not something that the government have put into place within England. But I just wondered if you knew if there was a possible maybe intention to move to that because obviously it's something that 
works and would be a good thing potentially to see in place. And and then my other thing is that there's some very confusing messages about alcohol and driving because it's not clear cut. Everybody knows that when they get into a car, they must put a seatbelt on. Um, it saves your life. Um, it would be much clearer if the guidance said do not drink and do not drive, which it does. But <laughs> you can still drink a little bit, which then becomes a bit grey in terms of measuring units and things like that. So that was the other sort of question mm -hmm. I sort of had. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, the minimum unit pricing um, in Scotland is an interesting one. Um, there's evidence for success and there's evidence against success on what they've tried up in up in Scotland. Um, I think any anything where we can evidence success and non-success, I would be mindful of saying, yep, yeah, that's the way to be going. Um, I know up in Scotland, um, drug deaths have fallen quite significantly. Alcohol deaths are have fallen but not so significantly and I don't know if they've fallen enough to attribute that success and that fall in um, in mortality rate to minimum unit pricing. Um, we know that um, health concerns and um, um, we know that mortality from alcohol happens over a long 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 period of time um lots of people don't use alcohol as a one off and then die from it so um you know again it's really really difficult to be able to attribute any kind of fall in death to minimum unit pricing so yeah i think it's it's just being mindful on that and i think while there is that doubt I don't think there will be any kind of um, move from government towards that. Um, there might be, there might be, and um, we never know. There's a lot of speculation that there might be a new government um, towards the end of this year. Um, let's see what they do. Let's see what they do. Um, I know there's quite a few changes um, up in Scotland as well. So all of there's there's no drink offers. Um, they're all banned in Scotland. So where we would walk into Asda down here and you get your free for 20 quid on your crates before Christmas. Can't get any of that up in Scotland. Um, my dad lives just outside of um, Glasgow, um, about half an hour outside of Glasgow. Um, he lives in a little hamlet and they all take it in turns to drive down to Carlisle. So um, I'm sure Carlisle as the Tesco has a roar in trade and alcohol use um, going back across the border. <laughs> so again, I don't think I don't know if um, if that's going to have much of a much of a, a, a an impact. But it's it's worth trying these things. It's worth trying these initiatives to see what evidence there is, and the fact that there is some evidence coming out. I think you posted was it the Lancet um the, that you posted from so it's um you know if if we are getting some evidence that says it might make an improvement then that's worth investigating it's worth following up isn't it um i think uh when we're nearly at the end of our time um there's been lots of people saying thank you sean i've ian smart would you like to you've just left a little comment ian um and uh, slightly cut off at the end uh, initiatives such as the Safe Bus, Street Pastors, Universal Angels are well-meaning and there's no doubt they offer, provide a valuable service, but I have a concern that for some they normalise poor behaviour and discourage self-responsibility. I'm not quite sure what... Um, did you want to say anything more on that, Ian, just before we finish? Or Yeah, just a comment, really. I mean, th th there yep. are some really good organisations out there that, that yep. volunteers provide an excellent service to people. Um, but it, I, I, I see a trend that years ago when I went out for a for a bit of an evening, you looked after the people that you went out with and everybody made sure everybody got home. 
now there seems to be a culture that well somebody will pick up the pieces the safe bus will will look after you um oh. and, and send you home in the morning the street passers will pick you up dust you off give you some flip-flops and take you home or get you home uh, and and that seems to encourage some people to go out and, and let their hair down because there's a safety net that will sort them out that there's a lack of ownership of their own behavior uh, and a thought of okay what are the consequences going to be they don't care because somebody will pick them up and look them up look after them Thank you, Ian. We'll just take a quick question from, from Kelly before G Sean gives us the final word and we, we say farewell. So it wasn't really wasn't really a question, but it was just to kind of follow on from what Jenny said about the people driving for work. That's something that I've I've seen quite a lot in the health checks again, you know, um people saying, Oh no, well I drive for work, so I don't don't drink Monday to Friday, but then they binge drink on the weekend. Mm -hmm. So it's just kind of look out for that, that even though they really good point. that they could still be having sort of a harmful drinking levels, even if they're not drinking during the week. Absolutely. Um, sorry, Jennifer. Yeah, I forgot you. Uh, you mentioned um, drink driving as well. Um, I think it's it's one of those things where we, we could recommend um, we could recommend that you don't drink and drive. Um, and it would be so much better if the law said um, absolutely no alcohol. Um, really difficult to do that though um it's really difficult to do that with any drug um when you have a look at um reports that are coming in of um drug driving you do see results of um over the legal limit of cocaine over the legal limit of cannabis what is the legal limit of cannabis so that's all to do with the test and the cutoff points of the test so we can't we can't say that absolutely none because there has to be a little bit of leeway in there for the test that's carried out and for the for the mechanism of, of that coming in so um i think it would be really beneficial if we could say zero anything above zero is is drink driving um the way the tests work i don't know if that's entirely practical Well, thank um, you very much. That's all right. Thank you, Andy. Thank you for having me. Um, it's been a pleasure. I've enjoyed meeting you all. Um, thank you. Thanks for being so we engaging. Thanks for the comments and the questions. Well, you're doing great work at Harbour. Uh, you've always had a great reputation. And um, I don't know, it's just really been really good today because I've looked into this subject quite a lot for the team. And, you know, you're but I'm not immersed in it like yourself and it's very interesting and I'll just say that um, um, we're trying to make uh, alcohol awareness training available to champions over the year there are some dates actually just been set in May and November we hope to get some more we should be about an hour to our two session just going into a bit more detail on alcohol following on from today so hopefully that'll be of interest to some people on this call but otherwise I, mean, I wish you all a good day and and Thank you again, Sean, very much for your time and hope to see you sometime. And thanks to all my colleagues and to all the rest of you. So goodbye. Thank goodbye. You. Thanks Bye. again. Thanks.